your Bible on or open your Bible if that's, you know, um, before we get to it. Um, we're going to be in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. But, um, and so as you, as you think about that, some of you are like, finally, Ephesians, like my favorite book. Um, I know. I've been holding on to it for a long time for you guys. Uh, so um, if someone came in, like right here this morning, somebody came in here this morning, to, up to you, and said, hey, like, and they had no church background. Like, they, they don't know any, like, they've never been to a church, they don't raised in a church, totally unfamiliar with what we're doing. And they, they approached you and said, hey, what are you guys, what is this? What are you guys doing? What is it like this? You guys are singing these songs, you're standing, then you're sitting, then you stand, and then you sit, and then you stand, and then you sit, you know, and, and there's all these, like, different movements, and what are you, what are you doing? Um, let, me, let me just say this, suggest to you this. This would be my hope, this would be the elders of the church, like, what the leaders of the church, this would be our just hope for you. In a really succinct way, let me put it to you this way. What we would be asking of you is to say this. Oh, well, if I could say it simply, my answer would be discipleship to Jesus. That, that's what we're doing. Like, when you think about why you gather on Sunday, when you think about a lot of the things that you're, you do when you talk about being a part of or co going to a church, discipleship to Jesus. That's just the mission of the church. Like, and that's not like... We're not cute or novel in that. <laughs> like any biblical church, really, that should be their mission. Like that, that's just the Bible. That's just what the Bible lays out for us. We're called to do is discipleship. Um, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here at the Oaks. That is our mission. Um, okay, but here's the thing. That, that word, that idea, discipleship to Jesus. And disciple, disciple. To be a disciple just means to be a learner or a follower. That's actually what it means in the text, in the Bible. And so um, it means to learn and to develop in the way of Jesus. It's, like, it's not just to look to Jesus as your Savior, but it's also to look to Jesus as the way. He's the, the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way. He's just, he, he models a particular kind of life. And so we want to embody that as his followers. Now, um, it's my conviction that although that is a simple thing, like if you said, oh, what I do at church is discipleship to Jesus, although that sounds simple, it can feel really big. Like I think if we're honest, you know, like, it, like write out a paragraph, like what's discipleship to Jesus? I think it can feel broad, you know. Um, it can feel like an abstract thing, particularly in our cultural moment. In our cultural moment, Although church attendance isn't really a big thing anymore, uh, like religiosity, spiritual, but being spiritual is extremely popular. So there's all sorts of religious streams and spiritual streams that you can get, um, you know, embedded into. And so, like, what does this mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, um, so our church, the Oaks, and many, many other really wonderful churches out there, what they typically do and what we're doing is we try to lay out particular values. We try to articulate and teach on core values, um, guiding convictions, if you will, that give shape to this idea of discipleship. Like, that just kind of help you understand how, to, how do we see discipleship to Jesus in this cultural moment. Like, I think if you went 200 years back and went to the church and said, what's this mission of this church 200 years ago? Hopefully, it would be the same discipleship to Jesus. That, that mission never changes. But over time, throughout cultural moments, depending on what's going on in the world and who we are being shaped, how we are being shaped by the cultural moment, sometimes the values shift a little bit in terms of how this discipleship looks and how do we emphasize, what do we emphasize. And so here's what I would say, that the Oaks, um, in terms of what our values are, it's just you could say them in three words. You've probably heard them before. Some of you maybe are new and you, you've never heard them, and that's okay. But rest, roots, renewal, those would be like three of the values that we say, hey, like our church has one mission, discipleship to Jesus. Under that, we have three values, rest, roots, renewal. Now, here's what I mean by rest, roots, renewal. In terms of rest, we value resting in God. As the church... We want to be a people who are attending to our souls. We, are, we want to be a people that value. We want to be a church that values slowing down, having days of the week, moments of our day where we stop, we cease production, we stop trying to get ahead, to tend to our souls and being attentive to God. 
That's per, through prayer, meditation, reading, singing songs, these sorts of things. I did a whole series back at the beginning of the year on sab- a Sabbath way of life. You could go back and listen to that if you wanted. We value, we want to value that as a church, resting in God. Two, we want to be a church that's being root, a rooted church, being rooted in the local church community. As a church, we want to be people who are not isolated from each other. Um, we don't want to be a church that we think of it as we, we can be mere spectators and consumers. We don't want to think of it that way. We, instead, we want to think of it as being deeply connected in service to each other. That's what we mean by that. And then three, we value bringing renewal to the brokenhearted around us. As a church, we, wanna, we don't want to just take care of our own souls in terms of, of maybe taking a day during the week to be still with God, to pray, to read the word, to give thanks for everything he's providing. We don't want to just contribute to the needs of the saints, as Paul says in Romans 12, but we also want to look out of our circle, outside of our community, and take care of people, look out for people that are broken, that are poor, that are disadvantaged, marginalized, oppressed, whatever it is. We want to be mindful of them too. We want to serve our neighbors that we live around. All three of those are relational. Did you see that? And they're, they're purposely designed that way because God is relational. Like everything about Christianity, everything about being someone who believes in God is deeply relational. God is relational. Think about it. He reveals himself to us. What we can know of him is relational. The Trinity, the Holy Trinity, is relational. Everything that God does is relational. Your whole life of as a Christian has to be think, you're thinking in terms of relationships. And so you could say it like this. When we, we're talking about rest, roots, renewal, they're all relational. They're relation to yourself and God, relational to other Christians, and your relationship to, to the people outside, that, that, that maybe that don't believe. You're always thinking about all of those relationships are deeply important to the Christian, or at least they should be. They, they're deeply important to the disciple. And by the way, we're not making that up. We see that in Jesus, right? Think about it. If you've ever read any of the Gospels, the Gospel narratives, you see Jesus almost living these out rhythmically. You know what I mean? Like, you, you see Jesus, Jesus is never rushed. Show me a passage in Scripture in the New Testament that reveals Jesus rushing. I dare you. Matter of fact, he annoys people sometimes because he seems to be so slow. He's just okay with a different speed and a different pace. He has this way of going slow. He has this way of sneaking off into the woods or up into the mountains to do what? To pray, to be by himself, to, to, to be attentive to his fa- heavenly Father. We see that in Jesus rhythmically. Then we see, of course, we see Jesus spending a huge amount of his time, at least in, what we know of in terms of his ministry, with his core disciples, right? Teaching the word to them, teaching them a, a completely different way of life. He was eating with them, spending time with them, serving them, and teaching them. And then, of course, maybe the most famously, we know, one of the things we know of Jesus is he frequently went around speaking, teaching, serving, and healing the poor and the broken, didn't he? You can't miss those elements if you look at Jesus' life. That's what he did. He snuck off to be alone, to stop. He spent time with his core disciples, the believers, and then he went off and helped and healed the poor and the sick. I could go on and on about all three of those. That's a snapshot, okay? I could go on and on and for hours, really, about all three. But really what we're doing today, and we've already mentioned it, is we just want to sit today and the coming few weeks and think about this idea of roots, being rooted into the local church, being rooted into local Christian community. Today, I want us to consider just the why. It's real simple. I don't think this is going to be a super expansive idea or sermon today. It's just why. Why? I like to go to the fundamental, like let's understand. Why? Like if I say, hey, why do you, why do you get embedded or rooted into a local church? If your answer is like, well, because I'm supposed to, then it's like, well, then, hey, we, we got some work to do. Right? Like let's know. That's a circular argument. That's like you're not getting anywhere. Why? Let's be able to give a hope and a reason for what we're doing. Why? 
Why should we be rooted into the local church? Why should we know people like other brothers and sisters in Christ very well and let them know us? And why should we be serving them and making it a point to take our particular wirings and gifts and help them? Why should we consider that of a, you know, huge importance? After today, I'll give the how. We'll spend weeks on the how, which is what you're going to really want to know probably. Like, how do we do it? In other words, what kind of Christian community do we need to be? And not enough churches spend time talking about that. We'll do that for the rest of the series. But for today, let's just answer why. All right. There's no, much better, no better place that I can think of in the scriptures to answer the why of Christian community than Ephesians. All right. Particularly this passage here, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. Let me, let me, let's read it. Paul says this. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth, it's here. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that, boy, has Paul ever heard of a run-on sentence before? <laughs> Sorry. Verse 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. There it is. You don't even need me to preach, right? It's like right there. I hate, let me just say, I hate jumping into the middle of a New Testament letter like that with no context. Now, it's Ephesians, and if you're, church, if you're a church person, you're like, don't worry, I know the whole book. I love Ephesians. But maybe you don't, and that's okay. Like maybe you're new here, or you've never read the Bible before, or maybe you've been church, but you're like, yeah, I'm just still not familiar with Ephesians. That's okay. Um, it's a really beautiful book, right? Uh, it's, it's a wonderful letter. It's really difficult to jump right into the middle of a New Testament. I don't recommend that. I actually recommend any time, if you can, when you sit down to read any of the New Testament letters, like a book like Ephesians, just read it from start to finish. It'll make way more sense to you, actually. It's really unhelpful to just jump into the middle of it out of context. A bit, particularly a book like Ephesians. Because if you notice, in every, like almost every paragraph in Ephesians begins with a therefore or a, like a so that. Um, and so you, you end up, you start there and then you end up having to go back a paragraph and then you go, well, now I gotta go back another. And next thing you know, you're at chapter one, verse one. So it's just more helpful. So for the sake of context, remember here, let me, in case you, you don't know, Paul begins the book of Ephesians just gushing over God's grace. Maybe you know that and you remember that. Yeah, he just, he just can't, he, he cannot believe what God has chosen to do of his own accord, which is reach down and save sinners 
you know, that the people are saved, not by their works, not of their own, their own religious efforts, but by God's grace alone. Then he reached down and saved. And, and what he begins to emphasize is not just that um, God has been so lavishly gracious to us sinners, but then he begins to emphasize this, uh, this, this, this mysterious reality of, of bringing a really diverse crew together, Jews and Gentiles, people that just didn't fit, people that didn't like each other, didn't belong together, that, you know, they looked down on each other. And, and Paul just feels, he feels totally called to communicate that, oh my gosh, the church is the manifold wisdom of God being revealed to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. And that's like a, any number of a, a lot of sentences in, in, in the book of Ephesians where you're like, what does that even mean? You know, every sentence is just so pregnant, full of meaning. It's dense, and you have to sit with it for a while. But, but Paul is essentially saying, look, man, this is unbelievable that God has had this secret plan from the very beginning to reveal his wisdom to the angels and whoever else is ruling in some heavenly realm. I don't know. This is beyond me. But Paul is saying, look, God has had a secret to reveal to them this massive drama that they didn't see coming. And the drama is unfolding in the church. And that drama is fascinating to them because what they're getting to witness is a bunch of people that didn't belong together working things out, being reconciled to each other because God has been reconciling them to him. You with me? That's what he's doing in the book of Ephesians. He's completely astounded by it, and he wants them astounded by it. And then he gets into this thing at the end of chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians, where he's like, show, he's being very pastoral, and he's like, man, this is my desire for you Christians. This is my great hope. And he just shares with them his prayer for them. Like, this is what I'm praying for you. And he tells them, this is what he says. This is Ephesians 3, uh, verse 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what, that's what Paul wants. That's lofty divine speech, but essentially Paul is just saying, I want nothing more for you Christians than for you to be really stable. I want you to be really stable and strong in your understanding of Jesus' love for you. Like unwavering in it. I want you to be really grounded deep into Jesus' love. I want you to know this love that you can't fully know. Did you catch that? It's a, it's a very strange paradoxical statement, what he says there. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. To know the love of Jesus that surpasses knowledge. Now just sit with that. If you're a slow reader and you're a thinker on that, you're going, well, how can you know something that you can't really know? Right? I sat with this for hours, truthfully. I'm like, what is this? What is and then it begins to dawn on me. I'm like, well, it makes a lot of sense, actually, right? Like, I'm a parent. I have kids. So do I love my kids? Of course I love my kids. I, 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 do my kids know that they love them? I mean, they do when I give them sweet stuff. But I think they do, you know? I think they do. I think they get it. I think they know. Like, Dad loves me. Can my kids know how much I love them? No way. No way. There's no way. They, have, they will not grasp it. Like, there's, I can't articulate it in a particular way. Like, there's just, they don't contain the ability to grasp. I was talking to Pastor Eric about it, and he's like, maybe like one day when they grow up, if they become parent, like, they'll, maybe, yeah. And it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe. Like, they cannot understand fully how much I love them. But they can know it in a, in a very deep way. They can. That's my hope. For them. That's what I want for them. And in some way, I think they can know it on such a level that it, it not only grounds them, right? Like they're, they're, not, they're unwavering in it. They're like, no, I totally know. The one thing I know is my dad loves me. Uh, but it also can get so embedded into them, so deep into them, that it becomes like an operating force in their life. That's what I would want. You know, the fascinating thing about true love is that baked into true love is this idea of like desire for maturity. I mean, think about it, right? Like if, if I said, I love my kids, 
and then I said, but I don't really want them to mature, you'd be like, ew, I don't, I, there's something weirdly toxic about that. I don't know if that's a proper understanding of love. You, you, you with me? Like, so there is this idea in really, like, proper, a proper understanding of what true love is, is it's like, I, I love you. I'm not feeding off of you. I'm, I love you in such a way that I actually want to see you develop. Like, that's my desire. I want to see you mature and you become a lover. Like, you steward in some way and take responsibility for loving in the way that I love you. That's like a proper, I think, understanding of love. I, I, I think that's what Paul means. I think that's what Paul wants for the church. I think that's what Paul wants for us, to be rooted and grounded in love, in Christ's love, so that it matures us, that it grows us to be secure and strong. Not perfect, not without flaws, but not easily thrown off course. Okay, so what's that maturing, rooted person look like? <laughs> What's the path of the maturing Christian? Well, Ephesians 4, right? What did it tell you? What did it tell us? We can say a lot of things about it, but the one most obvious, yet I think really often overlooked things, is that they, the maturing uh, per person of Christ, the, the person that is maturing in the love of Jesus, they are not living out this grace and love in isolation, are they? They're not living it out apart from other Christians. I mean, hopefully that was the most obvious thing that jumped out in Ephesians 4. What I think is interesting is after Paul declares his desire for their maturity, he doesn't say, therefore, because that's how Ephesians 4 began, isn't it? Therefore. He doesn't say, um, therefore, get plugged into a local church. That's not what he said. Matter of fact, I don't know if Paul ever says that. Ever. And you might be, you, you, it'd be fair for you to say, I know. You pastors get up all the time, and you say stuff like, become a member, and do this and do that, and the Bible never says it. And I'm like, I know, I know, it doesn't say it. Paul doesn't say that. But what does he say? What he does is he starts addressing our loving efforts to stay connected and committed to each other. That's what he does. My, my point is this. Paul doesn't say, hey, 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 Christian, my deep desire is that you, you experience the fullness of God, which is just a divine, lofty way of saying, I, my desire is that you mature fully into Christ Jesus. That's what I want for you. And he doesn't say, he doesn't say get rooted in the church because Paul assumes it. it. He can't conceive any other way. Paul cannot conceive of a maturing Christian apart from deep interconnectedness to other Christians. That's why he doesn't say it. I mean, look, I'm not hijacking Ephesians, just taking Ephesians 4, looking at it and its narrow purpose and its intent to this particular audience and then stretching it beyond its original intent. I'm not doing that. This is like the entire New Testament. This is Acts 2 on. Look at Acts 2 on, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, I think that this is kind of the whole, what it's saying over and over again. Here's a snapshot. Romans 12, 5, we are members of one another. It's in Romans 5 that Paul says, contribute to the needs of the saints, right? Seek to show hospitality. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Galatians 6, 10, do good to everyone. And then he goes and says, and especially to those who are the, of the household of faith. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 1 Peter 2, if you're like, well, that's just Paul. We're sick of Paul. Okay. 1 Peter 2, 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood. That's the church. That's short for the church. Honor everyone, but love the church, fear God. <laughs> I love Peter. I could keep going, right? We haven't even got to 1 John. It's through the whole New Testament. It just assumes it over and over and over again. And here in Ephesians 4, Paul succinctly shows us why we have this responsibility to other Christians. And this is what I want you to hear, please. This is super important. I think that we don't get this as Christians sometimes because the grace that in which God, God has shown you in Christ Jesus, this grace that hopefully you know and you, you think about and you, re, you recognize that I am a new creation in God, not by my works, but by grace. 
That's what the Bible wants to make very clear. Yes, but this grace isn't just a saving grace. It's an equipping grace. Essentially, I want you to think of it as like God's grace has two functions in your life. It's not just to save you. It's also to equip you. It's to give you a, a, a particular kind, a very particular, a very specific, a very unique kind of responsibility. A way of taking responsibility for other Christians. I mean, look at Ephesians 4, verse 7. He says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. But what's he saying? Is Paul saying that some of us are saved more than others? No, that's not what he's saying. There's no way that's what he's saying. <laughs> Read the rest of like, his letters. That's not what he's saying. He's saying God's grace has birthed unique gifts in each of us specifically for the purpose of working and serving with and alongside other Christians in the mission of God. That's what he's saying. Now, from here, we, like, this is the point where you could say, all right, we're going to get a sermon on spiritual gifts, and then they're going to give a spiritual uh, gifts assessment after the church service is over. I'm going to go pick that up. And t no, we're not going to do that today. And that might, might be a valuable sermon, and, and, and a value, I'm not against any of that. That's great. But that's not the point of today. That's a sermon for another time. I'm simply trying to just make the case that it is beautiful. It is utterly beautiful to me how God has creatively designed us to be interconnected. He's designed it that way. That our maturity as Christians, it's mysteriously bound up, not just in Christ, but in each other. You need to see that. Please see that. That your maturity is not just bound up in Christ, but in each other. We don't often think of it that way because we're... And I, I could go on this big, long diatribe about our Western, modern Western individualism and how we just think more isolated. We don't think collectively. We think it's, like, it's just me. It's just me, me and Jesus, me and Jesus, me and Jesus. When like the Bible has no concept of that. And I know because we use, we, 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 the church has perpetuated that because we use language like, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And I'm not against that phrase but we make it completely individualistic. When the Bible does not conceive of Christianity that way, it conceives of it as a community, as a family. God is a doing a new work in a people, a new humanity, not just a single person. Our maturity is bound up in each other. Hear it again, verse 15 of our passage. He says, rather, he's speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up, mature in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So to work properly does not mean that you lose your sense of identity, your sense of self, your sense of individuality. No, 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 no. None of that, actually. It, your individuality, your uniqueness is highlighted here. It's like you've been given a certain particular uniqueness. It doesn't disappear when you embed yourself into the church. It comes alive. And it comes alive because it's, it begins to manifest and show you and the others around you, oh, this is how you, this is how you uniquely are wired to help other people and serve them. That's what it means. It means to use and apply our individuality and our uniqueness in the service of other Christians. In contrast, then, therefore, to work improperly as a Christian is to honor your individuality and stay in isolation. To say, I, here's who I am. I don't fit. I don't belong or this or whatever. I'm going to stay over here. That's to work improperly, according to the Bible. So, why be rooted in the local church? It's simple, right? Like, for growth, for maturity, yours and mine, yours and each other's. Now, you're like, I, that's not novel. But no, but think about it. How often do people think of it in those terms? I think a lot of people think of church in in their, for themselves. Why do you go to church? I go to church for comfort. I go to church for inspiration. This is why it's easy for us to sit on the couch and just watch it. 
I'm not attacking that. Like we've been through it. This world has been through, we've been all through all kinds of crazy stuff. We're all trying to figure out like what are the normal rhythms and practices that are matter to us. So the, the don't, I, I'm not condemned. I'm just saying we tend to think in our involvement and in our sacrifices for, ourself, for ourselves. Like what am I getting out of this? That's why like if I go to a church and it's like the preaching hasn't been that great or the, the music stinks or... Uh, I don't know what all the reasons are, people that hate church now. There's a lot. Um, but we're thinking of it like consumers. And the Bible just doesn't think of it that way. It's like, man, Jesus has loved me, saved me, and specifically wired me and made me a new human being, whatever that means. I'm trying to figure it out, and I need to figure it out in the context of a relationship with somebody else that's processing the same strange thing. That's, that's, properly, that's proper Christianity. And that matures us and that grows us. Which is why if you separate yourself, not only does maturity not happen, atrophy does. I have seen it over and over and over again. I have watched friends atrophy as they separate themselves from the nasty, <laughs> you know, messy reality of Christian community. They think they're coming alive by separating and coming up, popping up over here. But they're not. They're not at all. This is so important to understand because it's the relational dynamics of the church that don't just serve as your path towards maturity, but it serves as our path towards testimony, like the very thing that we're meant as the church to be. Jesus lived and died to bring about this new humanity, a new set of people that relate differently to each other. Like that's what he's showing the world and the authorities and the heavenly places, is I'm gonna create this people that are gonna work out reconciliation. And in some strange way, the angels are like, this is crazy. These people are not supposed to like each other. They're terrible to each other, and yet they're sticking it out, and they're trying to figure it out, and they're amazed by it. That's what he's getting at. It's why um, like the church is meant to be the testimony of this kind of work of reconciliation. It's why the, uh, the uh, scholar and theologian F.F. F. Bruce says this, the church is the pilot scheme, the pilot plant of the future world. The church is meant to be this, this, this illustration. So if God, think of it this way. This is, I've, this is the first time I've ever thought of this. But it's, so this could go really bad. But it's like, so if God is sitting down with a heavenly council and trying to explain his work through Christ, what he's had planned all along, this work of grace. And he's saying, yeah, it's crazy. And they're like, could we get an illustration? And he, it, God would say, yes, them. them. That's, that's my illustration. That's God's, the church is the illustration of his work of grace and reconciliation. The plan of God from, from the very beginning, which is to unite and reconcile all things to him. That's what he's doing. That we are being reconciled to God and we are being reconciled to each other. The entire earth, the entire cosmos is going to be reconciled in Christ. Just sit with that for a minute. Now, I know what many of us think. We are reminded when we think about this, we are reminded when we are reminded of our calling to serve and sacrifice for each other in the church, we think, oh boy, because the church is so bad at this. Like, the truth is, we think if I'd be more rooted if the church was more loving. If the church didn't hurt people, if the church didn't overlook people, if it didn't make size um, or money or power or politics like their priorities, then maybe I would root myself into it more. I get, I, I, or maybe you're just sitting there thinking, like, I, I don't have any of those feelings. This is what he's saying is certainly the ideal, but this season for me is just hard because I lack time. Like, I, I just lack time, you know, between my job or my kids or whatever is going on. I just lack spiritual conviction, maybe. Maybe you're just like, I just, 
I just feel depressed and I just don't feel like superly compelled to get involved in the church anymore. Like it's just not where I'm at. Like I, I want you to know, listen to me, I understand and resonate with every single one of these. I'm telling you, I really do. I, I've been through all of them. I was raised in the church, man. I was practically birthed on the stage. I don't mean that in some kind of a heavenly way, like I was special. I mean, I was just like, my dad was a pastor, you know? That's why you don't hear me up here ever giving like uh, football illustrations. I didn't have a football dad. I don't know anything about it. You could, tell, you could literally teach me the positions. I just lost a ton of street cred with a lot of you dudes. Like, my dad was just, that's just not, I was raised in the church. I was raised around the Bible and music and art. That's just, that was my life. I can't, you know what I mean? Can't change it. And so therefore, for me, I've hated the church. I've deconstructed the church. I have deconstructed my faith. I have left the church. I have been arrogant and naive about the church. I mean, like, I'm te- like, some of you sit there and you think, he hasn't. I've been through every one of those spaces. You know, like, every one of them. I've felt them. I've seen the good, the bad, all of it. And I, and I think I, I still probably have a whole lot more seasons to go through, like ways of growing and understanding what it means. But, but let me just say, through all of that, by God's grace, I'm learning to be hopefully realistic and compelled by the church. I, I'm trying to say that in one sense, I see the brokenness of church, believe me. Like the church building should have a sign on it right out front that should say, warning, people get hurt here sometimes. Like it should. Uh, but let me just say this. I've been thinking about this a lot this week and I'm learning to also be sympathetic to the church, like to church people, to you, <laughs> to you, like to me. Because what I think often gets lost on modern Western people these days is that is an honesty is an honesty to what the well-intentioned church community is attempting to do and i know by no means so i mean all of them okay i'm not i i'm not making excuses for churches that have gone completely away from the original gospel i'm not talking about that i'm talking about churches that have a well like they are trying to stick it to the original gospel and live it out the church community is not tackling some small task. It's unbelievable what they're trying to do. It's really quite remarkable when you think about it. I mean, just read the rest of Ephesians 4 as one of many, many examples. I mean, it's just, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. How's that going for you? We're members of one another. Be angry, but don't sin. Like, it's so realistic, but yet so high of a standard. It's like, I know, I know you're going to get angry, but don't belittle someone in your anger. Right? Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that, <laughs> here's why we don't want you to steal, and we want you to work up. Do you have something to share with anyone in need? Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for your building up as fits the occasion, that it gives grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now you show me, please, Seriously, in all humility, show me a community on earth that is attempting that. Show me some, someone outside of the church that's attempting that, pulling that off. Look, I mean, I'm just, I'm, what I'm trying to communicate is I understand the criticism to the church and saying, that place, those people are self-righteous, sanctimonious, judgmental. And I'm like, yeah, 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 totally. Totally. It can totally feel like that sometimes. Look at what they're trying to do, man. 
Who was attempting to do this? It's remarkable when you think about it. And so I'm learning, what I'm trying to say is that I think the maturity happens in the context of Christ-centered, Christ-loving community. Maturity happens there because what those people are doing is they're holding on to the tension of it. Like, eyes wide open, it's broken, and it's beautiful too. And they're holding that tension. And some people are not willing to hold that tension. Some people are just totally naive to the brokenness. Some of us started out that way, maybe. And some of us, some people are, I, I, I think, probably willfully ignorant or arrogantly proud about the beauty of it. Like somehow it's somewhere else out there. Like I can go get, in, I'm not, and I'm not picking on them, but like, like I can go get embedded into orange theory and find that. No, you will not. Some of you are like, what is orange theory? <laughs> Look it up. But, so I, it's just, I, we, what we want to do is we want to hold the tension of both the brokenness and the beauty of it. That's the real intersection of Christ's grace. When you embed yourself into a local church community with your, your eyes and your heart wide open, and you show a stick to not because of its perfection, um, but because of the beauty of what it could be. What it could be. And it often is in ordinary little moments. I think when you do that, Jesus shows up in your life and he works in your life in a really profound way. I really do. It's not like Jesus didn't know how ugly and weak we could, we could be when he was dying and when he was resurrected for us. He fully knew. But he is a loving covenant God, meaning he's a God that makes promises and commitments and he sticks to them. And he sticks to his plan to make his grace known in us so that we might be something over time that we never imagined. Now, I've just become utterly convinced, please hear me as we finish, I've become utterly convinced that Jesus shows up in our lives as individuals and as a community when we see the difficulty and the beauty of what he is actually calling us to. Like we see it for what it really is and we go, that's unbelievably difficult but we take it serious and we try it anyway. Like that when we have the audacity to say, I'm gonna try to do that, and I don't know how I'm gonna pull it off, and I'm gonna have to have a power outside of myself to do it. And I think when we do that, I think God shows up in our lives in really, really special ways. That's what I believe, wholeheartedly. Because I think sometimes, secretly, we read the Bible and the standards that which it holds up for the Christian and the Christian community, and I think, well, and I think secretly some of us are holding on to this idea of, well, well, this is awesome and crazy, but Jesus doesn't actually expect us to try to live it out. And I'm like, yes, he does. I just, yes, he does. And I don't think he expects us to live it out in our own power. I think, I think he expects us to realize that in him, every, I mean, this is what Paul says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. So, like, let's ask him. God, maybe we could be a community that actually lives out this kind of humility, this kind of mercy, this kind of purity, this kind of holiness. And so I don't know where you're at um, in, in terms of your involvement in the church, and I could give a list of ways, like groups, stu Bible studies, classes, obviously Sunday gatherings, all of that. I think you can work that out over time, and we're going to spend weeks on this. Um, but as we enter our time of communion, I just want you to sit and take time. There's not a bunch of homework for you to do or anything like that. It's just sit and think. Like, just where's your heart with the church? Some of you are like, man, I'm rooted in the church. And I'm like, then sit and give thanks. Give thanks and ask for God to just continue to work on your love. Your love for people, your love for broken people, people that are struggling in and out of the church or they don't know what to do with the church or they're wrestling with all the abuse that they've been through or whatever it is. Just, just pray for those people. It's a good opportunity for you to do that. Now, we end each sermon with communion. If you're new to that, if you're, no, that's great. It's okay. I'm, I'm glad. It, we're perfectly fine with newcomers to this. But basically, um, the night that Jesus was betrayed, before he was crucified, taken and crucified, he was with his disciples, and he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he was talking about that and referencing his body, that his body was broken for us. 
Like for our sin, for our shame, for our struggles, for our inability to get along and our hatred of each other. And he took a cup of wine and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Right. So what he's saying is this, is this is my blood that's poured out for you, that's shed for you. All of this, all of this is a reminder that he's our substitute. That's what we're doing when we take communion. We're like, yes, Christ is my substitute. Christ is the one that changes me. Christ is the one that makes me a new creation. He makes me a new person over time. It's a process. And so we just want to take a minute to pray, to think about these things, to give thanks, to proclaim Jesus, and, and wrestle with whatever we need to wrestle with and ask for help. If you're here and you're visiting, so glad you are, and you're a Christian, you're invited to take part, this station or this station, there'll be lines coming up. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. And we want to ask for your help to do far, things that are far more abundant than we ever could imagine and our ability to be, to wrestle with our relationships, to humble ourselves in our relationships, to be learners in our relationships, to be people that confess our own sins, to be people that wrestle with forgiveness, wrestle with, for, with mercy, all of these things, Father. We, as the church, want to be not only unified, but purified. This is what your word teaches us. It is my hope that we are at least this morning compelled by that, that we see the beauty in it. It's in Christ's name that we always pray. Amen.
hear this benediction. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid, and may peace be with you.